star, look a weather and a lee. Blow high, blow low, and so sail it we. I see a wreck to windward and a lofty ship to lee. A sailing down all on the coast of high Barbary. Blow high, blow low, blow high. Blow low. Are you a pirate, a man of war? Right, we blow high, blow low, and so sail it we. Oh, I am not a pirate, but a man of war. Right, he a sailing down along the coast of high Barbary. A sailing, a sailing, 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 sailing. Sailing. For broad aside, for broad aside, we fought all on the main. Blow high, blow low, and so sailed we, until at last the frigate shot the pirate's mast away. A sailing down along the coast of high Barbary. But oh, it was a cruel sight, and grief it us was sore. Blow high, blow low, and so sailed we. To see them all drowning as they tried to swim ashore. A sail, a sail, sailing, 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 a sailing down along the coast of high Barbary. Good afternoon, shipmates, and welcome to the Navy Yard. We're at the Navy Museum, the fighting top of the Constitution behind me here. Happy birthday. What a place to have a birthday, and what a day it's going to be today. We're going to have a lot of fun. But speaking of time, can you believe it? It's been a year since we've been working together, and I promise you a pretty special year, and it's been certainly an event field year. But more on that later. We got a lot of stuff going on today. We're going to have a lot of fun. We got cake cutting and things. We got a lot of good people here today, by the way. And let me show you. We got the band. Say hi to the band. We got a, the fighting top, as I said before. We got cannons. We got the ship's wheel. My goodness, we got Constitution sailors up from Boston. And we got my favorite sailors up from Norfolk. So, and whoa, look who we have here. Come on out here, Mick Pond. Our new Mick Pond. Mike Stevens, Master Chief Mike Stevens, from an aircraft mechanic to the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy. Welcome. Yes, it's great to have you here. Great to be here, sir. Thank you. How's it going so far? So far, it's uh, been drinking through a fire hose, but other than that, everything's going <laughs> Yeah, you got going. it all locked up, don't you? <laughs> all locked up, sir. Yeah, right. Okay, look, let's have some fun. Let's do something that we really like to do. Let's do a re-enlistment. Absolutely. All right, let's gonna bring, we're going to bring them out here. All right, detail. A ten. Hut. Five steps forward. March. All right. Are you all ready to uh, come on back in the Navy? Yes, yes sir. sir. Oh, I got it. We got to get some loudness here. Are you ready to come back in the Navy? Yes, sir. All right. Great. You've been out for about a day now, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know what it was like, but it's time. So we'll do the oath of office. Everybody ready? Okay. Attention to oath. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I. Do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that, I that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over me and the officers appointed over in accordance with regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. So help, help me God. God. All right, congratulations, shipmates. Welcome back into the Navy. All right. So let's find out who our new shipmates are. Petty Officer Frias, is that correct? Yes, sir. That's and where, where did you grow up? Wahala, South Carolina. South Carolina. Is that a Gamecock or a Clemson Tiger? Go Clemson, go All right. Tigers. A lot of orange in your house, right? That's right. All right. Petty Officer Chavez, where are you from? Originally from Peru, sir. Um, from Peru? Yes, sir. Excellent. Outstanding. And where do you live now? Uh, here in Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, Virginia. System and DAW120. Great. What a pleasure. Hello, miss. Hello. Kim What's your Rivera. name? What's your name? Kimberly Rivera. Rivera. And uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in stationed for, in Virginia. Virginia. Yes. Are you you're a Navy brat? Yes, I am. Uh-huh. What did your folks do? My father is a retired commander. 
Retired commander, huh? Yes. That's okay. He's, he's, he's happy where you are, right? Yes. Welcome aboard. Hello, buddy. Good morning, where, sir. Where'd you grow up? Macon, Illinois. Macon, Illinois. Yeah. All right. Is he a Bears fan? The Bears? That's right. Is that yeah. right? Illinois and the Bears, huh? Yes, sir. All right. It's a tough year so far, right? <laughs> Chief, where did you grow up? Kingston, North Carolina, sir. Kingston, North Carolina, huh? Yes, sir. Okay. What do we put near that? Tobacco Road somewhere? Yes, sir. All right. Do you pick your team? I'm a Cowboys fan and a Tar Heels fan. Cowboys and Tar Heels, uh, good colors. Okay. Okay, front row, dismissed. All right, let's meet these other sailors. Hello, kiddo, where'd you grow up? No, sir, I'm from Forestville, Maryland. From Forestville, Maryland. Forestville, Maryland, so you got to be a Redskins fan. No, I'm a Cowboys fan. Cowboys <laughs> fan, you're one brave guy around this town. All right, nice to have you aboard. How about you, kiddo, where'd you grow up? Brooklyn, Georgia. Brooklyn, Georgia, huh? Okay. Are you uh, are you a yellow jacket guy or are you a uh, you know bulldog guy? Yellow jackets. Yellow jackets. I think you might have picked. Well, they're both losing so far, but that's okay. Falcons. Yes, sir. All right. Good. Hello, Miss. Mm -hmm. Where did you grow up? Florida. Florida. Where in Florida? Mm -hmm. Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Vacation land, right? That's where people go. <laughs> that's where people go. Thank you for uh, reenlisting. Hello, Miss. Where did you grow up? Hazel, Texas, sir. Hazel. Yes, sir. Hazel or Hazel? Hazel. Hazel. Is that near to? Is that like in Tornado Alley? No, sir. It's no? by Fort Worth. It's by Fort Worth, huh? Yes, You're a Cowboys sir. fan, then, Absolutely. Huh? Sir. All right. We got a lot of Cowboys here. Yeah, Hello, Chief. Where'd you grow up? Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Yes, a lot sir. of old people live down there, don't they? A lot they? of old people. There's a few young people too. But <laughs> well, I got my lot all picked out. <laughs> How about you, Mick? Fun? Not yet, what sir. are you <laughs> laughing at? <laughs> Thank you for reenlisting. Yes, Hello, you. Miss. Where'd you grow up? Queens, New York. Queens, New York, huh? Yes, sir. Man, them Yankees came back last night against our Orioles. So, are you an, you're a Yankees fan, aren't you? I'm not a anything fan, so I don't watch sports. <laughs> you take no chances, right? That's right. Sir. All right, excellent. You're not one to gamble, huh? Okay, second row dismissed. <laughs> well, shipmates, uh, that's a lot of fun doing reenlistments. It's my favorite. Uh, having folks re decide to stay Navy. And, uh, and continue the, the service. So let me tell you a little bit. Uh, as I said, it's, uh, here we are, 2012. It's the 200th commemoration of the War of 1812. It's also the 70th commemoration of the Battle of Midway. It's the 70th commemoration of the Battle of Coral Sea. And it's the 50th commemoration of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Your shipmates, our predecessors, had a lot to do in the Cuban Missile Crisis as we led the quarantine there uh, in and around Cuba, a very, very important part of the Cold War, which sometimes we don't really talk a lot about. But a little bit on the War of 1812. Uh, again, the fighting top behind me, the scene around here, and what we've been talking about all year. We've been doing commemorations from New Orleans through Florida, up the East Coast, Norfolk, Baltimore, New York, and on through the Great Lakes. And it's been terrific. America has gotten the opportunity to meet you, your shipmates, and many others, and understand really more about our Navy and your Navy. And as I think about the War of 1812 and our legacy, three things come to mind all the time, looking back as we look at where we are today. Number one, technology matters. The best ships in, in the navies of the world, the, the highest tech ships, were in fact U.S. Navy ships in the War of 1812. If you look behind me and you look at that structure, that's original. We had the best ships and made of the best material, and that's why we had a ship called Old Ironsides, made of such good material, cannonballs actually bounced off the sides, and it was exclaimed by a, a British officer, she must be made of iron. Number two, we had confident and proficient crews. And if you look at the examples up here, of people understanding the rigging and working hard. Our crews worked hard on seamanship, they worked hard on gunnery, and frankly, we outgunned the enemy in the War of 1812. And lastly, we had bold and accountable leaders. Leaders such as Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry in the Battle of, of Lake Erie, who fundamentally changed the whole course of the war uh, by him taking charge of that battle, changing ships when he needed to, and he was losing his ship right underneath him and carrying on the war. Those three things, so important, and those are the things that we carry forward in our legacy. As we look forward to our next year together, 
I tell you right now, I'm very happy with sailing directions. And I ask you to check them out. They will be our path ahead. And those six words, the words we've been talking about all year, they still remain relevant, and they're still the way we're going to go forward. War fighting is going to be first. We have got to operate forward. That's where we're at our best. And we've got to be ready. That's going to be our legacy. That's going to be the brush you and I will use as we paint our way into the next year. Now let me leave you one last uh, little factoid, if you will, and then we're going to take some questions. If you look on the website, our website, my website, you'll see the logbook is in there. And I've recently posted our diversity, my diversity vision statement, how we're going to go forward in our path together to mine, to pull together all the talent that we have in the Navy and where we're going to go get talent in the country, our diversity vision. And second, I'm going to post pretty soon our position report. It's going to be a laydown of a, kind of taking a fix of where we've been over the last year and what changes we need to make on our track as we go out ahead. Some things have changed here and there. We've got to change some tweaks, some things. But I'll lay down in this position report where we're headed in the year ahead. So, Mick Pond, what do you say? Some Q's and A's? I'm ready, ready sir. to go. Let's do it. Okay, let's bring in a question. Afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is C.E. One Liner from White House Communications. My question is, now that the Navy's manning is stabilized, stabilizing and this round of the ERB is completed and PTS is getting revamped early next year, how long before an increase in promotions will be seen and will SRBs for critical NECs increase? Yeah, I think that, uh, as you state, uh, promotion rates have stabilized. Um, how long before they increase? That's difficult to say. It really will be a matter of the, the lay down of the force as we look at each rating, as we look at the manning within the rating. But as you, as you stated, recently promotion rates have increased, and it is a reflection uh, of the balancing across the ratings that has taken place. Uh, Perform to Serve is going to be with us. Uh, it's going to be, I think, better. Uh, one of the things we've done is we are, as we look at each of the ratings, we're not looking at just the year somebody applies. We're looking at two years out ahead of that. So it's a three-year total look, and I think uh, that we will be able to sustain what we have today, which is about between eight and nine out of 10 uh, performed to serve requests are being approved. Uh, so I feel pretty good about where we are now. I don't see an ERB anytime in the future. Sir, this question comes from our internet audience. This is LS1 Chris Russell from Maritime Expeditionary Security Squadron 2. Are there any plans for implementing the 15-year early retirement option for all hands? Uh, well, I'll tell you, the 15-year early retirement will remain an option. I think you used the term right. Uh, we call it an authority. I want that tool in the tool bag in order to be able to, well, to balance the force uh, as necessary. But I really don't plan to, I don't think we need it right now. We're balanced very well. We've gone from 35 overmanned ratings to about seven right now. So we're in pretty good shape. But uh, we will ask for the authority, but right now I don't see the, the need to use it. This comes from several sailors asking similar questions about op tempo and the increased carrier presence in SETCOM. Sir, I would like to know where you stand on the carrier 2.0 requirements and what is being done to meet the needs of manning issues at sea. Are there any other manning initiatives being renewed beyond recent nav admins? What will Effect 2.0 have on current sea slash shore rotation for <laughs> senior enlisted as well as junior enlisted? That's a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> let me try, I'll try to set the, kind of the piece. Uh, the good news is uh, the hard work that the sailors are doing out there, those people who are out there getting it done is clearly recognized uh, all the way to the White House. Uh, the need for two carrier strike groups in the Arabian Gulf has been here since 2010 and we've agreed to do so through March of next year. I think all of you know that. And the John C. Stennis is on her way uh, to do that. Now, uh, where I stand on that is our country needs us and we are ready to respond and we as they, the John C. Stennis and sailors like that. Uh, we are good through March. And what I mean by that is the carrier strike groups and the, and, the, and the ships that have responded up to date have been expected to be ready to respond. They have been in what we call the sustainment phase. If we go beyond next March, we're going to have to look very closely at the laydown of the, where those ships stand, 
and training, and we, we need to make probably some adjustments in the maintenance piece, in the certification piece, and in some of the training pieces. And so we'll take a look at that. Uh, but as, as I look out there ahead, uh, we're going to track op tempo very closely. We'll track home tempo of our sailors and the individual tempo. And all of those will become a factor as we move out ahead. CTR to Ryan J. Marriott from USS Wasp. My question is, in regards to wearing multiple warfare designators, with the introduction of EIDWS on board LHD and CVN platforms, it is highly possible for motivated sailors in certain ratings to arrive from A schools and transfer from those platforms yeah. with three designators. My question is, why can't we wear what we have earned, at least while wearing service and full dress uniforms? Yeah. Hey, Mick Pond, this may be something you want to address. Sure. Uh, if you're one of those sailors that have earned one of those warfares or two and then working on a third, then I would like to say good on you and keep getting after those warfare quals. And to all our sailors, please do the same. Did you know that we have over 20 warfare uh, qualification pins that can be worn? Uh, so the Navy had to make a decision at some point on how many uh, should, we, should we wear and what's appropriate. And what we found is that two warfare pins seems to be the right number because two warfare pins doesn't interfere with the wearing of other devices. At one time, we had no limit, and I personally knew of a sailor that was wearing five warfare pins from our special warfare community, uh, and it was just too much because it interfered with the uniform and other things that that sailor could or should have been wearing. So uh, CNO, we've decided that two is the right number, and that's what we're going to stick with. You know, but good on them. I mean, these are people that uh, have the judicious and go out and get the, the, the job done. And uh, I'd say let's make sure it's documented in your record as you get ready for perform to serve or anything else like that. Uh, these are people who have got, you know, a lot of drive. Absolutely. And it's excellent. Absolutely. Excellent. Commander Ross Mavila from NJROTC Senior Instructor. When will the service dress khaki uniform be formally and finally approved and made available to officers and chiefs of the fleet? Well, we've been wear testing the service dress khaki long enough, and we've, we've got good data on it. The, what we need to do is get a balance of where do we intend to wear the uniform. It'll be an optional uniform, so it's, it's not going to be throughout the fleet. It'll be, it's destined for some certain sites, and you've got to balance that with, well, how much will it cost based upon the expected wear. So we'll do that balance and we'll make a decision and I think that decision will be out pretty soon. Question from Art Clean, no command given. In this time of financial austerity, has Congress begun to reconsider the obligation period from one to two years for the operations and maintenance appropriation? Uh, from one year to two year? Uh, well, we authorize and appropriate bills yearly and so that, that's how that will go on for forever. Uh, I think until they change the law, the process of a law. So really, uh, it won't be a two-year uh, appropriation. It'll be an annual appropriation, an annual authorization. CS3 Jonathan Gill, rumor has it that the dress white uniform being changed to have blue piping. When can we expect this change if it is true? Mick Pond? Sure. We've done a lot of good work. The fleet's done a lot of good work with this new uniform. and. What you'll see is uh, October of 15, that uniform will begin to be issued to our new recruits at Great Lakes. And then October of 18, you'll see that uniform start to be populated throughout the fleet. Uh, that's the current plan as it stands. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commander Mark Yell from NavSent. When will the NWU Type 1 Aquaflage uniforms be discontinued? I think that's up your alley sure. too. Uh, what I would like to share with our shipmates out there is that there's no plan to discontinue the NWU Type 1. Uh, we understand that it may not be the perfect uniform in all situations, but we believe we've found a uniform that gets us pretty close to the middle. And for the foreseeable future, unless directed otherwise, yeah. the plan is to continue to wear the NWU and more importantly, to become experts in where we wear it and how we wear it. Yeah, I think you got that one right. Lieutenant Commander Michael Payne from Pensacola Branch Health Clinic. Our Lieutenant Commanders frequently deploy alongside their O4 major counterparts with the Marines, Army, and Air Force in multiple joint environments. Lieutenant Commanders are generally permitted to be retained to retirement, making them career orientated. Lieutenant Commanders are frequently officers in charge, XOs are even COs of smaller ships, yet all other services refer to their O4 rank as field grade, mid grade officers. 
While the Navy maintains their, the lesser junior officer designation at 04, actual daily environments have lieutenant commanders treated as mid-grade officers. I have been continually blessed with strong leaders. But uniform instructions and titles do not reflect the same respecting. Our British naval heritage, but also uniquely aware of uniform changes, reflecting modern day joint forces reality. Why are Navy lieutenant commanders still referred to as junior officers without scrambled eggs compared with their mid-grade sister service peers? Well, I tell you, that's a mouthful, and uh, I haven't really given it that kind of thought. Uh, I'll take that question back. It's always good to have something to look up, and then we'll take a look at it. Uh, I would tell you my view and, and the way I've understood it is a junior officer runs through lieutenant and an 04 is mid-grade officer. So uh, we'll take a look at that and see what makes sense and we'll change if it makes sense. This question is from the chat. CTIC Andrew Young from NIOC Maryland. Will there be any additional sailors allowed to retire under the Congress approved 15 year retirement option? Well, uh, I think that really involves uh, you know, temporary early retirement authorization. And uh, right now, no, we don't plan for that. Uh, we'll ha we will ask for the authority. It's a force shaping tool. We'll use the force shaping tool as appropriate in the future. But for now, uh, I like the way the ratings are laid out. I, I think we're just about right, and I don't see that one right now. PS1 Dennis Ellsworth from Landstuhl Regional Medical Center. Navy's PFA currently has consequences for failing. Most try to pass with a minimum score. Why doesn't the Navy do more to reward those who excel in the PFA? This would create a carrot and a stick approach, not just the stick. Nick Pond? Sure. I think it's important that we all remember that first and foremost, uh, physical fitness is about operational readiness and the health of our sailors. We don't try to use uh, uh, physical fitness standards as a means to separate sailors, but more as a means to retain sailors. Uh, it's a good question that we could always look at. Uh, we've had this discussion before, is how do we better incentivize it? Uh, and we've talked about it in the past, but we really haven't uh, done anything with that. So it's a great question. Maybe we can take it on board and take another look at it. But mostly it's about the health of our force and the health of our sailors. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that, you're right. Uh, if somebody does very well uh, on the PFA and the PRT, uh, it should be documented. Consider documented in their report of fitness or in their evaluation. It's always available in the summary of action. And it's in fact when we grade uh, people's appearance and how they come across the fact that they are a fit person uh, and show that example of leadership, it should be documented. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Michael Imperato from Department of the Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff Intelligence. China has recently been boldly asserting territorial claims in the South China Sea. What security concerns do you have for the nation as our federal debt climbs, and what do you envision the Navy's role will be in maintaining national security in light of these economic concerns? Well, uh, good question. Uh, basically, the Navy is the keeper of the sea lines of communications. We need to be out and about in what I call the, the, the maritime strategic crossroads the Strait of Hormuz, the Strait of Malacca, the Straits of Gibraltar, all of those where the lifeline of our economy, the world's economy, passes through. And we will always continue to do that. That's operating forward. Uh, the the uh, prognosis, if you will, or the claims of uh, the People's Republic of China, uh, we stand by the, uh, the attributes of the law of the sea and the freedom of navigation. And that is that uh, in, in international waters, uh, open passages, uh, free, freedom of navigation uh, should be guaranteed to all. That's where we stand. Uh, with regard to the, uh, the deficit and the difficulty in economic times, uh, a strong economy will give you uh, good security and strong security. And uh, I believe in that. And that's where the president stands. That's where the country stands. This question is from the chat. AO2, AO2 Joseph Tona. NMC Detachment, Pax River, Maryland. Are the rumors true about the 10 and a half months deployments? No. MTCS Hoffman from Surveillance and Reconnaissance Field Support Office. What is the current and future plan for manning enlisted women on submarines? Well, uh, we're, going, we're doing quite well in our plans for uh, women on submarines. Uh, right now, the officer program, which is the one under, um, in progress uh, on our SSBNs and our SSGNs, 
is going quite well. We've, we've had on the order of about 60 uh, applicants to fill about 56 billets, and that's pretty good right now. Uh, we would like to expand that toward the Virginia class, but uh, we have to take a look at that, and, and here's what it is. We didn't get as many applicants as we thought we were going to get in that we got, like I said, in the 60s to fill 56. Pretty good selectivity rate, all well qualified. For us to expand beyond the current goal of about 56 in our SSBNs and SSGNs, we need to understand, do we, will we have the applicants to fill into the Virginia class? Uh, and we need to, to take a look at that. As we move toward bringing uh, enlisted women on submarines, including SSNs, we need to look at what kind of a hierarchy of leadership we will have. That's important. We need role models. We need mentors for uh, our junior enlisted, uh, and we'll need senior enlisted to do that. So the bottom line is going well so far, moving at a deliberate pace. I think next year, somewhere in the middle of, in the 13-ish time frame, uh, we'll be looking toward the Virginia class submarine officer and then enlisted. But again, we got to assess that we have the right leadership uh, available so that we can do this right. SC2 RJ Mahoney from USS Chaffee. My question is, what is the Navy doing to ensure our technicians are adequately trained to perform their duties in the fleet? Hmm. Yeah, Colin, you want to take a look? Sure. Uh, right now we have about a 30 percent uh, blend of computer-based training versus a 70 percent blend of hands-on training. And we find that those two together uh, right now are producing uh, some very good training, very effective and very efficient. And we plan to continue down that path. Uh, we realize that several years ago we may have gotten a little bit too far to the computer-based training. The fleet gave us feedback. We accepted that fleet feedback and we uh, quickly made the adjustments. And right now, I believe from my experience and what I'm seeing uh, in the fleet and in the classrooms that we're doing a very, very good job of providing the Navy with some well-trained technicians. Yeah. Command Master Chief John Taylor from the U.S. Naval Academy. Do you think that an early retirement board, ERB, or a continuation to serve board for our Department of Navy civilians would help us save money in this fiscally constrained era that we are going through? Well, it's hard to say that you would save money. Uh, I guess, uh, simply put and, and said directly, it, you might. But uh, civilian personnel management comes under the Office of Program uh, Management. Uh, military personnel comes under the Department of Defense and solely within that purview. Uh, within uh, the, while uh, managing civilian personnel, if, if one month needs to make a change to the organization, one wants to reduce the force, there are various force shaping tools for civilian personnel, such as a, a variable or voluntary separation incentive pay, VSIP, where one uh, pays a stipend encouraging one to resign or to find uh, another career path. There is an early retirement uh, option that exists uh, and can be put in place. Uh, these are actually held, these are authorities that are held at what we call the Echelon II level, which is really the the hiring and managing authority uh, for civilian personnel. So you have the overarching management done by the, uh, laid out by the Office of Program, uh, Personnel Management, excuse me, Office of Personnel Management, and then they, they delegate authorities to echelon levels who can then manage it. But two separate processes uh, for managing military personnel and civilian personnel. LS1 Laura Schmidt from Bremerton Priority Material Office Headquarters. IA assignments allow eligible first class petty officers to bypass the chief's exam and go straight to the selection board. With a forced drawdown occurring in Afghanistan, where will the opportunities for fast track billets be in the future? We wanted to make sure when we stood up the IA program that we provided our sailors with equal opportunity to success and promote. What I'd like to share with the sailor and the sailors that are listening is that we must remember that it's first and foremost about sustained superior performance. Then it's about sustained superior performance while on sea duty. So it's not so much about what you're doing, but it's more about, uh, or not so much about where you're doing it, but it's more about how you're doing what you're assigned. Uh, and so we always talk about CNO that it uh, doesn't matter what kind of job you have or where you're at in the Navy, but uh, that we must do our very best at whatever job that is, and we must do that over a sustained period of time. And if you can do that, then most assuredly you'll promote in the future. 
I couldn't agree more. Every mentor that I've had that you know I highly respect just said, the job that you have at hand, do the best you can in that job, uh, and things will take care of themselves. And I, I think that's a pretty good piece of advice. IT1 Billy J. House from CSG10. What are your thoughts on CPO 365, and do you believe this is the best option for developing senior enlisted leadership that is aware, involved, and technically competent? That's your sweet spot. CPO 365. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, we, we need to understand that we start building chief petty officers the day that they graduate from boot camp, and then even more so when they become first-class petty officers. And so we found that it's much uh, better to prepare first-class petty officers to become chiefs with a continuum of learning and training. So we do that year-round rather than trying to cram it all into a six-week period of time. And as we stand here right now, uh, we have Master Chiefs in the fleet that are currently helping me to review the CPO 365 program so that we can become even better leaders in the future. So I believe it's the continuum of learning and training far more than it is uh, that kind of quick hit uh, during that six-week period of time. Right, right. This is Lieutenant Joseph Martin from Military Sealift Command Far East. As we celebrate our Navy's birthday, many of us are interested in the continuum of service concept described by some as creating on and off ramps to allow seamless transfer from active duty to drilling reserve status and vice versa. Nav Admin 274-12 recently addressed this concept in the enlisted force. When do you foresee this becoming a reality for commissioned officers? Well, actually, uh, uh, the rapid transition, if you will, from active to reserve uh, is a reality right now for the officer corps. Uh, at, as a matter of an anecdote, my son uh, completed his active duty service uh, just about a year ago, just over a year ago, and transitioned within about a week to the reserve corps. So he, he serves as the, in the reserves. So there are programs in place to enable active duty officers to transition to uh, drilling reservists. There's also a program for active duty officers to go into the uh, IRR, I can't remember what that acronym means, uh, but to do that for a period of time and then come back into the active core. So there are on ramps and off ramps, but when coming back into the officer, into the active core from the reserves, uh, you, you have to resonate with the needs of the active core. Uh, there are ways to do this for a year, for half a year, for a number of years, and to be drilling. So there's a number of programs, a number of opportunities. And a tip of the hat to the Chief of uh, Navy Reserve and to the Navy Reserve Program who have done amazing things to streamline this program so that we have that continuum of service in the active or in the reserve. It's, it's really a, a, a good uh, process put in place uh, by, the, by the reserve community. This question is from chat. MMC Schumann, Pearl Harbor Navy Shipyard. Is there a process for ensuring reoccurring NAV admins are released on time? Uh, yes, there's a process in place. Uh, sometimes it, it doesn't run as smoothly as we'd like. But NAV admins are reviewed periodically, some uh, sooner than others, uh, but they have a temporal nature to it. And when they complete their, uh, their relevancy, if you will, they are either canceled or they are uh, revised uh, accordingly. This question is from Chet. I worry about the new sailors currently on deployment with the USS John C. Stennis. Since their turnaround time from the last deployment was so quick, what is the U.S. Navy doing to help them cope? Well, uh, what we are doing is we look at them on their deployment. We're looking for definite uh, quality of life port visits, uh, good port visits, quality of service uh, port visits, if you will. Uh, number two, when they return, we're looking at their schedule very closely to see to it that they get an appropriate return, transition. Uh, they've got a long period of maintenance following that, and we're looking very closely at the individual's tempo as well as the home tempo, how much they will be home. Our goal is 50% of the time non-deployed at home uh, and the ship's up tempo itself. So uh, we're looking very closely at what the great sailors of the John C. Stennis did. As the Secretary of Defense said, when he went out and saw them off and spoke to them, uh, they are the best option that the country had for the mission at hand out there in the Gulf, for them to go out and do what they needed to do. And uh, I give a tip of the hat to the John C. Stennis, to the team, the entire team 
out there in the entire strike group. Uh, they turn quickly and very professionally, and I thank you very much for that. YNC Ware, Reserves. With the new RC and AC opportunities, will there be options for senior enlisted to take part in those billets? Are any chance to allow E7s to return to undermanned billets? Next one, you want to try that? Uh, I really haven't uh, heard anything about that CNO, yeah. with the uh, senior enlisted uh, having that opportunity. I'd say that you know, the option's always on the table, but we just haven't had the discussion. Yeah, we'll take a look at that okay. and see what's, what's are the doable. This question is from chat. ET1 Sext from NRD Relay, with the way that physical fitness is evolving throughout the rest of the world, is the Navy looking at altering the PFA to fall more in line with current fitness programs? Well, uh, the PFA is uh, it's studied all the time, trust me. I mean, everybody out there knows. There's always a rumor we're going to do something new. But the means by which we measure someone's fitness uh, is, is acceptable. It's worthwhile. It's not perfect by any stretch, but for the main, uh, done very well. It is looked at very closely by med competent medical authority, our medical authority, from both the uh, physical um, evaluation part, that is your body, in addition to your fitness part. Uh, and there are uh, waivers here and there, in other words, attributes if somebody has an unusual body type. And we'll continue to look at that and tweak this as, as to try and do the best we can for the vast majority of the sailors and for the purposes of the program. Lieutenant Grant Greenwell, CWAS, with increasing cost of LCS and modules, are studies being conducted to look at smaller, cheaper vessels or conversion of JHSV? Uh, yes, I am looking at uh, smaller, cheaper, lethal, underline, vessel opportunities. Uh, also looking at what a, J, a joint high-speed vessel, which is a fast catamaran with a nice flight deck, and a lot of volume to, to move things quickly through the ocean. What can we do to those from crew serve weapons to different modules? But with regard to the literal combat ship, that is a unique combination of speed and volume, uh, two types of vessels uh, somewhat different, one with a very large helo deck and the other with a very large mission bay under a helo deck uh, that each have a special set of attributes you combine that with the mission module capability of mine countermeasure, anti-submarine warfare, surface uh, warfare, if you will, and mission and modules that we have yet to, to lay out there. Uh, we think it is a high payback uh, investment right now. It looks pretty good. So the literal combat ship will be a main part of our Navy, but we're looking for other options as well that can be effective, uh, in the, relevant in the future, and lethal. This question is from chat. Sir, word on the deck plate is that Congress has not yet approved funding for the repair of the USS Miami. Will the repair take place? Uh, I'll answer the last part. Yes, the repair will take place. The, uh, the Congress has not completed uh, their bill for FY13. They need to do the authorization and then they'll do the appropriations. We have a request in there and it is being viewed right now quite favorably uh, by the Congress as we interface with the staff. Uh, to get started in fiscal year 12, uh, we've, we've requested a reprogramming, and that has been uh, uh, viewed with favor. It has been approved by the Congress. We look pretty good in the repair of the Miami. Sir, this is the last question, and it is from chat. John Guzman, New York. What advice do you have for a future sailor? I will be enlisted in about a year. Nick Pond, I can't think of a better person <laughs> to answer a question for a future sailor. My ears are burning. I'm, I'm going to keep this <laughs> short and simple, but I, I ask that all of our sailors listening uh, pay close attention because success in the Navy uh, requires, in my opinion, us to be excellent in three areas. One, work hard. Two, stay out of trouble. And three, be a good and decent person both in and out of uniform. If you can do those three things, I can almost assure you that you will have a successful, productive, and happy career. Nicely done. I'd like to close with uh, one little clip. Early, one of the early quest, earlier questions I had was a rumor for 10-month uh, appointments. And op-tempo is a hot topic, and it's something that I'm looking at uh, constantly. Uh, let me expound on my answer, which was no. And I stand by that answer. But the fact of the matter is the Eisenhower is on about a nine-month deployment. 
Uh, she was uh, a little late getting out of maintenance, uh, and we had a discussion with the leadership that that was going to be a nine-month deployment in order for her to kind of catch up and cover the uh, amount of uh, deployment and the, uh, what was necessary in the world. But as we look out there uh, for the rest of FY13, about eight to eight month uh, and two week deployments uh, will be the way uh, our carriers, that will be what our carriers are getting. As you look across the force, it's different for P3, that's about six months. It's different for submarines, that's about six months. And it's a little different for cruisers and destroyers. And so what I'm saying is uh, it won't, 10 months is not uh, the future subject to a, an entirely different change in the way we do business. Uh, and, and, but it, it varies, and uh, keep your ear to the ground and ask your leadership, where do we stand? So that was great. Um, that was great. I don't know about you, I'm a little hungry. Uh, let's say we have some cake. I say we have some cake. Uh, you're not a big cake eater, but I know you are little a cake, cake eater. eater. <laughs> All right, <laughs> excellent. Robinson is presenting the CNO with a model 1862 Amos Cutlass from USS Constitution. This was the standard edge weapon used by seamen through the Civil War. Joining the CNO are two sailors representing our proud heritage and warfighting spirit of today. BMSR Abby Applegate from the USS Constitution. BMSR Applegate is from Spearfish, South Dakota and enlisted in the Navy in April 2012. And BM2 Nathaniel Pennywell from the USS Dort. BM2 Pennywell is from Forestville, Maryland, and enlisted in the Navy in March 2009. And re-enlisted in the Navy today, as we just saw. Okay, I've seen you, uh, Petty Officer Applegate, using this saber, and I know you're pretty good, so I trust we can do a cake cutting now yes, in a sir. good manner. All right, are we ready, everybody? All right, hand on the saber. One, two, three, look up and smile. Push. Up there, Mick Pond. <laughs> Camera. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well done, team. Uh, well done. All right. And a salute to my shipmates. Here we go. Cake all around, cake all around. Mick Pond, are you ready? I'm ready. I got a little dainty piece for you. It's so given you're the one that did all that talk about the PRT and where we're going with it and the importance of it. Okay. Here you are, Redskins fan. All you right. got a piece? All right. One more for me. <laughs> for gotta make this. This will be the diet piece here uh, for the elder statesman. Okay. Happy birthday, everybody. Happy birthday.